The good news of Jesus Christ, the message, begins here, following to the letter the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Watch closely, I'm sending my preacher ahead of you. He'll make the road smooth for you. Thunder in the desert. Prepare for God's arrival. Make the road smooth and straight. John the Baptizer appeared in the wild, preaching a baptism of life change that leads to forgiveness of sins. People thronged to him from Judea and Jerusalem and, as they confessed their sins, were baptized by him in the Jordan River into a changed life. John wore a camel hair habit, tied at the waist with a leather belt. He ate locusts and wild field honey. As he preached he said, the real action comes next, the star in this drama, to whom I'm a mere stagehand, will change your life. I'm baptizing you here in the river, turning your old life in for a kingdom life. His baptism, a holy baptism by the Holy Spirit, will change you from the inside out. At this time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. The moment he came out of the water, he saw the sky split open and God's Spirit, looking like a dove, come down on him. Along with the Spirit, a voice, You are my Son, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life. At once, this same Spirit pushed Jesus out into the wild. For forty wilderness days and nights he was tested by Satan. Wild animals were his companions, and angels took care of him. After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee preaching the message of God, time's up. God's kingdom is here. Change your life and believe the message. Passing along the beach of Lake Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew net fishing. Fishing was their regular work. Jesus said to them, Come with me. I'll make a new kind of fisherman out of you. I'll show you how to catch men and women instead of perch and bass. They didn't ask questions. They dropped their nets and followed. A dozen yards or so down the beach, he saw the brothers James and John, Zebedee's sons. They were in the boat, mending their fish nets. Right off, he made the same offer. Immediately, they left their father Zebedee, the boat, and the hired hands, and followed. Then they entered Capernaum. When the Sabbath arrived, Jesus lost no time in getting to the meeting place. He spent the day there teaching. They were surprised at his teaching, so forthright, so confident, not quibbling and quoting like the religion scholars. Suddenly, while still in the meeting place, he was interrupted by a man who was deeply disturbed and yelling out, What business do you have here with us, Jesus? Nazarene. I know what you're up to. You're the Holy One of God, and you've come to destroy us. Jesus shut him up, quiet. Get out of him. The afflicting spirit threw the man into spasms, protesting loudly, and got out. Everyone there was spellbound, buzzing with curiosity. What's going on here? A new teaching that does what it says. He shuts up defiling, demonic spirits and tells them to get lost. News of this traveled fast and was soon all over Galilee. Directly on leaving the meeting place, they came to Simon and Andrew's house, accompanied by James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed, burning up with fever. They told Jesus. He went to her, took her hand, and raised her up. No sooner had the fever left than she was up fixing dinner for them. That evening, after the sun was down, they brought sick and evil afflicted people to him, the whole city lined up at his door. He cured their sick bodies and tormented spirits. 
Because the demons knew his true identity, he didn't let them say a word. While it was still night, way before dawn, he got up and went out to a secluded spot and prayed. Simon and those with him went looking for him. They found him and said, Everybody's looking for you. Jesus said, Let's go to the rest of the villages so I can preach there also. This is why I've come. He went to their meeting places all through Galilee, preaching and throwing out the demons. A leper came to him, begging on his knees, If you want to, you can cleanse me. Deeply moved, Jesus put out his hand, touched him, and said, I want to. Be clean. Then and there the leprosy was gone, his skin smooth and healthy. Jesus dismissed him with strict orders, say nothing to anyone. Take the offering for cleansing that Moses prescribed and present yourself to the priest. This will validate your healing to the people. But as soon as the man was out of earshot, he told everyone he met what had happened, spreading the news all over town. So Jesus kept to out-of-the-way places, no longer able to move freely in and out of the city. But people found him, and came from all over. After a few days, Jesus returned to Capernaum, and word got around that he was back home. A crowd gathered, jamming the entrance so no one could get in or out. He was teaching the word. They brought a paraplegic to him, carried by four men. When they weren't able to get in because of the crowd, they removed part of the roof and lowered the paraplegic on his stretcher. Impressed by their bold belief, Jesus said to the paraplegic, Son, I forgive your sins. Some religion scholars sitting there started whispering among themselves, He can't talk that way. That's blasphemy. God and only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew right away what they were thinking, and said, Why are you so skeptical? Which is simpler, to say to the paraplegic, I forgive your sins, or say, Get up, take your stretcher, and start walking. Well, just so it's clear that I'm the Son of Man and authorized to do either, or both, he looked now at the paraplegic, Get up. Pick up your stretcher and go home. And the man did it, got up, grabbed his stretcher, and walked out, with everyone there watching him. They rubbed their eyes, stunned, and then praised God, saying, We've never seen anything like this. Then Jesus went again to walk alongside the lake. Again a crowd came to him, and he taught them. Strolling along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, at his work collecting taxes. Jesus said, Come along with me. He came. Later Jesus and his disciples were at home having supper with a collection of disreputable guests. Unlikely as it seems, more than a few of them had become followers. The religion scholars and Pharisees saw him keeping this kind of company and lit into his disciples, what kind of example is this, acting cozy with the misfits? Jesus, overhearing, shot back, who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? I'm here inviting the sin sick, not the spiritually fit. The disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees made a practice of fasting. Some people confronted Jesus, why do the followers of John and the Pharisees take on the discipline of fasting, but your followers don't? Jesus said, when you're celebrating a wedding, you don't skimp on the cake and wine. You feast. Later you may need to pull in your belt, but not now. As long as the bride and groom are with you, you have a good time. No one throws cold water on a friendly bonfire. This is kingdom come. He went on, no one cuts up a fine silk scarf to patch old work clothes, you want fabrics that match. And you don't put your wine in cracked bottles. 
One Sabbath day he was walking through a field of ripe grain. As his disciples made a path, they pulled off heads of grain. The Pharisees told on them to Jesus, Look, your disciples are breaking Sabbath rules. Jesus said, Really? Haven't you ever read what David did when he was hungry, along with those who were with him? How he entered the sanctuary and ate fresh bread off the altar, with the chief priest Abiathar right there watching, holy bread that no one but priests were allowed to eat, and handed it out to his companions. Then Jesus said, The Sabbath was made to serve us, we weren't made to serve the Sabbath. The Son of Man is no yes man to the Sabbath. He's in charge. Then he went back in the meeting place where he found a man with a crippled hand. The Pharisees had their eyes on Jesus to see if he would heal him, hoping to catch him in a Sabbath violation. He said to the man with the crippled hand, Stand here where we can see you. Then he spoke to the people, What kind of action suits the Sabbath best? Doing good or doing evil? Helping people or leaving them helpless? No one said a word. He looked them in the eye, one after another, angry now, furious at their hard-nosed religion. He said to the man, Hold out your hand. He held it out, it was as good as new. The Pharisees got out as fast as they could, sputtering about how they would join forces with Herod's followers and ruin him. Jesus went off with his disciples to the sea to get away. But a huge crowd from Galilee trailed after them, also from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, across the Jordan, and around Tyre and Sidon, swarms of people who had heard the reports and had come to see for themselves. He told his disciples to get a boat ready so he wouldn't be trampled by the crowd. He had healed many people, and now everyone who had something wrong was pushing and shoving to get near and touch him. Evil spirits, when they recognized him, fell down and cried out, You are the Son of God. But Jesus would have none of it. He shut them up, forbidding them to identify him in public. He climbed a mountain and invited those he wanted with him. They climbed together. He settled on twelve, and designated them apostles. The plan was that they would be with him, and he would send them out to proclaim the word and give them authority to banish demons. These are the twelve. Simon, Jesus later named him Peter, meaning, Rock. James, son of Zebedee. John, brother of James, Jesus nicknamed the Zebedee brothers Boanerges, meaning, Sons of Thunder. Andrew. Philip. Bartholomew. Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Jesus came home and, as usual, a crowd gathered, so many making demands on him that there wasn't even time to eat. His friends heard what was going on and went to rescue him, by force if necessary. They suspected he was believing his own press. The religion scholars from Jerusalem came down spreading rumors that he was working black magic, using devil tricks to impress them with spiritual power. Jesus confronted their slander with a story, does it make sense to send a devil to catch a devil, to use Satan to get rid of Satan? A constantly squabbling family disintegrates. If Satan were fighting Satan, there soon wouldn't be any Satan left. Do you think it's possible in broad daylight to enter the house of an awake, able-bodied man, and walk off with his possessions unless you tie him up first? Tie him up, though, and you can clean him out. Listen to this carefully. I'm warning you. There's nothing done or said that can't be forgiven. But if you persist in your slanders against God's Holy Spirit, 
you are repudiating the very one who forgives, sawing off the branch on which you're sitting, severing by your own perversity all connection with the one who forgives. He gave this warning because they were accusing him of being in league with evil. Just then his mother and brothers showed up. Standing outside, they relayed a message that they wanted a word with him. He was surrounded by the crowd when he was given the message, Your mother and brothers and sisters are outside looking for you. Jesus responded, Who do you think are my mother and brothers? Looking around, taking in everyone seated around him, he said, Right here, right in front of you, my mother and my brothers. Obedience is thicker than blood. The person who obeys God's will is my brother and sister and mother. He went back to teaching by the sea. A crowd built up to such a great size that he had to get into an offshore boat, using the boat as a pulpit as the people pushed to the water's edge. He taught by using stories, many stories. Listen. What do you make of this? A farmer planted seed. As he scattered the seed, some of it fell on the road and birds ate it. Some fell in the gravel, it sprouted quickly but didn't put down roots, so when the sun came up it withered just as quickly. Some fell in the weeds, as it came up, it was strangled among the weeds and nothing came of it. Some fell on good earth and came up with a flourish, producing a harvest exceeding his wildest dreams. Are you listening to this? Really listening? When they were off by themselves, those who were close to him, along with the twelve, asked about the stories. He told them, you've been given insight into God's kingdom, you know how it works. But to those who can't see it yet, everything comes in stories, creating readiness, nudging them toward a welcome awakening. These are people whose eyes are open but don't see a thing, whose ears are open but don't understand a word, who avoid making an about face and getting forgiven. He continued, Do you see how this story works? All my stories work this way. The farmer plants the word. Some people are like the seed that falls on the hardened soil of the road. No sooner do they hear the word than Satan snatches away what has been planted in them. And some are like the seed that lands in the gravel. When they first hear the word, they respond with great enthusiasm. But there is such shallow soil of character that when the emotions wear off and some difficulty arrives, there is nothing to show for it. The seed cast in the weeds represents the ones who hear the kingdom news but are overwhelmed with worries about all the things they have to do and all the things they want to get. The stress strangles what they heard, and nothing comes of it. But the seed planted in the good earth represents those who hear the word, embrace it, and produce a harvest beyond their wildest dreams. Jesus went on, does anyone bring a lamp home and put it under a bucket or beneath the bed? Don't you put it up on a table or on the mantle? We're not keeping secrets, we're telling them, we're not hiding things, we're bringing them out into the open. Are you listening to this? Really listening? Listen carefully to what I am saying, and be wary of the shrewd advice that tells you how to get ahead in the world on your own. Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. Stinginess impoverishes. Then Jesus said, God's kingdom is like seed thrown on a field by a man who then goes to bed and forgets about it. The seed sprouts and grows, he has no idea how it happens. The earth does it all without his help, first a green stem of grass, then a bud, then the ripened grain. When the grain is fully formed, he reaps, harvest time. How can we picture God's kingdom? What kind of story can we use? It's like an acorn. 
When it lands on the ground it is quite small as seeds go, yet once it is planted it grows into a huge oak tree with thick branches. Eagles nest in it. With many stories like these, he presented his message to them, fitting the stories to their experience and maturity. He was never without a story when he spoke. When he was alone with his disciples, he went over everything, sorting out the tangles, untying the knots. Late that day he said to them, let's go across to the other side. They took him in the boat as he was. Other boats came along. A huge storm came up. Waves poured into the boat, threatening to sink it. And Jesus was in the stern, head on a pillow, sleeping. They roused him, saying, Teacher, is it nothing to you that we're going down? Awake now, he told the wind to pipe down and said to the sea, Quiet. Settle down. The wind ran out of breath, the sea became smooth as glass. Jesus reprimanded the disciples, Why are you such cowards? Don't you have any faith at all? They were in absolute awe, staggered. Who is this, anyway, they asked. Wind and sea at his beck and call. He went back to teaching by the sea. A crowd built up to such a great size that he had to get into an offshore boat, using the boat as a pulpit as the people pushed to the water's edge. He taught by using stories, many stories. Listen. What do you make of this? A farmer planted seed. As he scattered the seed, some of it fell on the road and birds ate it. Some fell in the gravel, it sprouted quickly but didn't put down roots, so when the sun came up it withered just as quickly. Some fell in the weeds, as it came up, it was strangled among the weeds and nothing came of it. Some fell on good earth and came up with a flourish, producing a harvest exceeding his wildest dreams. Are you listening to this? Really listening? When they were off by themselves, those who were close to him, along with the twelve, asked about the stories. He told them, you've been given insight into God's kingdom, you know how it works. But to those who can't see it yet, everything comes in stories, creating readiness, nudging them toward a welcome awakening. These are people whose eyes are open but don't see a thing, whose ears are open but don't understand a word, who avoid making an about face and getting forgiven. He continued, do you see how this story works? All my stories work this way. The farmer plants the word. Some people are like the seed that falls on the hardened soil of the road. No sooner do they hear the word than Satan snatches away what has been planted in them. And some are like the seed that lands in the gravel. When they first hear the word, they respond with great enthusiasm. But there is such shallow soil of character that when the emotions wear off and some difficulty arrives, there is nothing to show for it. The seed cast in the weeds represents the ones who hear the kingdom news but are overwhelmed with worries about all the things they have to do and all the things they want to get. The stress strangles what they heard, and nothing comes of it. But the seed planted in the good earth represents those who hear the word, embrace it, and produce a harvest beyond their wildest dreams. Jesus went on, does anyone bring a lamp home and put it under a bucket or beneath the bed? Don't you put it up on a table or on the mantel? We're not keeping secrets, we're telling them, we're not hiding things, we're bringing them out into the open. Are you listening to this? Really listening? Listen carefully to what I am saying, and be wary of the shrewd advice that tells you how to get ahead in the world on your own. Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. 
Stinginess impoverishes. Then Jesus said, God's kingdom is like seed thrown on a field by a man who then goes to bed and forgets about it. The seed sprouts and grows, he has no idea how it happens. The earth does it all without his help, first a green stem of grass, then a bud, then the ripened grain. When the grain is fully formed, he reaps, harvest time. How can we picture God's kingdom? What kind of story can we use? It's like an acorn. When it lands on the ground it is quite small as seeds go, yet once it is planted it grows into a huge oak tree with thick branches. Eagles nest in it. With many stories like these, he presented his message to them, fitting the stories to their experience and maturity. He was never without a story when he spoke. When he was alone with his disciples, he went over everything, sorting out the tangles, untying the knots. Late that day he said to them, let's go across to the other side. They took him in the boat as he was. Other boats came along. A huge storm came up. Waves poured into the boat, threatening to sink it. And Jesus was in the stern, head on a pillow, sleeping. They roused him, saying, Teacher, is it nothing to you that we're going down? Awake now, he told the wind to pipe down and said to the sea, Quiet. Settle down. The wind ran out of breath, the sea became smooth as glass. Jesus reprimanded the disciples, Why are you such cowards? Don't you have any faith at all? They were in absolute awe, staggered. Who is this, anyway, they asked. Wind and sea at his beck and call. He left there and returned to his hometown. His disciples came along. On the Sabbath, he gave a lecture in the meeting place. He stole the show, impressing everyone. We had no idea he was this good, they said. How did he get so wise all of a sudden, get such ability? But in the next breath they were cutting him down, he's just a carpenter, Mary's boy. We've known him since he was a kid. We know his brothers, James, Justice, Jude, and Simon, and his sisters. Who does he think he is? They tripped over what little they knew about him and fell, sprawling. And they never got any further. Jesus told them, a prophet has little honor in his hometown, among his relatives, on the streets he played in as a child. Jesus wasn't able to do much of anything there, he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them, that's all. He couldn't get over their stubbornness. He left and made a circuit of the other villages, teaching. Jesus called the twelve to him, and sent them out in pairs. He gave them authority and power to deal with the evil opposition. He sent them off with these instructions. Don't think you need a lot of extra equipment for this. You are the equipment. No special appeals for funds. Keep it simple. And no luxury inns. Get a modest place and be content there until you leave. If you're not welcomed, not listened to, quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. Then they were on the road. They preached with joyful urgency that life can be radically different, right and left they sent the demons packing, they brought wellness to the sick, anointing their bodies, healing their spirits. King Herod heard of all this, for by this time the name of Jesus was on everyone's lips. He said, this has to be John the baptizer come back from the dead, that's why he's able to work miracles. Others said, no, it's Elijah. Others said, he's a prophet, just like one of the old-time prophets. But Herod wouldn't budge, it's John, 
sure enough. I cut off his head, and now he's back, alive. Herod was the one who had ordered the arrest of John, put him in chains, and sent him to prison at the nagging of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had provoked Herod by naming his relationship with Herodias adultery. Herodias, smoldering with hate, wanted to kill him, but didn't dare because Herod was in awe of John. Convinced that he was a holy man, he gave him special treatment. Whenever he listened to him he was miserable with guilt, and yet he couldn't stay away. Something in John kept pulling him back. But a portentous day arrived when Herod threw a birthday party, inviting all the brass and bluebloods in Galilee. Herodias's daughter entered the banquet hall and danced for the guests. She charmed Herod and the guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me anything. I'll give you anything you want. Carried away, he kept on, I swear, I'll split my kingdom with you if you say so. She went back to her mother and said, What should I ask for? Ask for the head of John the baptizer. Excited, she ran back to the king and said, I want the head of John the baptizer served up on a platter. And I want it now. That sobered the king up fast. But unwilling to lose face with his guests, he caved in and let her have her wish. The king sent the executioner off to the prison with orders to bring back John's head. He went, cut off John's head, brought it back on a platter, and presented it to the girl, who gave it to her mother. When John's disciples heard about this, they came and got the body and gave it a decent burial. The apostles then rendezvoused with Jesus and reported on all that they had done and taught. Jesus said, Come off by yourselves, let's take a break and get a little rest. For there was constant coming and going. They didn't even have time to eat. So they got in the boat and went off to a remote place by themselves. Someone saw them going and the word got around. From the surrounding towns people went out on foot, running, and got there ahead of them. When Jesus arrived, he saw this huge crowd. At the sight of them, his heart broke, like sheep with no shepherd they were. He went right to work teaching them. When his disciples thought this had gone on long enough, it was now quite late in the day, they interrupted, We are a long way out in the country, and it's very late. Pronounce a benediction and send these folks off so they can get some supper. Jesus said, You do it. Fix supper for them. They replied, Are you serious? You want us to go spend a fortune on food for their supper? But he was quite serious. How many loaves of bread do you have? Take an inventory. That didn't take long. Five, they said, plus two fish. Jesus got them all to sit down in groups of fifty or a hundred, they looked like a patchwork quilt of wildflowers spread out on the green grass. He took the five loaves and two fish, lifted his face to heaven in prayer, blessed, broke, and gave the bread to the disciples, and the disciples in turn gave it to the people. He did the same with the fish. They all ate their fill. The disciples gathered twelve baskets of leftovers. More than five thousand were at the supper. As soon as the meal was finished, Jesus insisted that the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead across to Bethsaida while he dismissed the congregation. After sending them off, he climbed a mountain to pray. Late at night, the boat was far out at sea, Jesus was still by himself on land. He could see his men struggling with the oars, the wind having come up against them. At about four o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the sea. He intended to go right by them. 
But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and screamed, scared to death. Jesus was quick to comfort them, courage. It's me. Don't be afraid. As soon as he climbed into the boat, the wind died down. They were stunned, shaking their heads, wondering what was going on. They didn't understand what he had done at the supper. None of this had yet penetrated their hearts. They beached the boat at Genesaret and tied up at the landing. As soon as they got out of the boat, word got around fast. People ran this way and that, bringing their sick on stretchers to where they heard he was. Wherever he went, village or town or country crossroads, they brought their sick to the marketplace and begged him to let them touch the edge of his coat, that's all. And whoever touched him became well. The Pharisees, along with some religion scholars who had come from Jerusalem, gathered around him. They noticed that some of his disciples weren't being careful with ritual washings before meals. The Pharisees, Jews in general, in fact, would never eat a meal without going through the motions of a ritual hand washing, with an especially vigorous scrubbing if they had just come from the market, to say nothing of the scourings they'd give jugs and pots and pans. The Pharisees and religion scholars asked, why do your disciples brush off the rules, showing up at meals without washing their hands? Jesus answered, Isaiah was right about frauds like you, hit the bullseye in fact. These people make a big show of saying the right thing. But their heart isn't in it. They act like they are worshipping me. But they don't mean it. They just use me as a cover for teaching whatever suits their fancy, ditching God's command, and taking up the latest fads. He went on, well, good for you. You get rid of God's command so you won't be inconvenienced in following the religious fashions. Moses said, respect your father and mother, and anyone denouncing father or mother should be killed. But you weasel out of that by saying that it's perfectly acceptable to say to father or mother, Gift. What I owed you I've given as a gift to God, thus relieving yourselves of obligation to father or mother. You scratch out God's word and scrawl a whim in its place. You do a lot of things like this. Jesus called the crowd together again and said, Listen now, all of you, take this to heart. It's not what you swallow that pollutes your life, it's what you vomit, that's the real pollution. When he was back home after being with the crowd, his disciples said, we don't get it. Put it in plain language. Jesus said, are you being willfully stupid? Don't you see that what you swallow can't contaminate you? It doesn't enter your heart but your stomach, works its way through the intestines, and is finally flushed. That took care of dietary quibbling, Jesus was saying that all foods are fit to eat. He went on, it's what comes out of a person that pollutes, obscenities, lusts, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, depravity, deceptive dealings, carousing, mean looks, slander, arrogance, foolishness, all these are vomit from the heart. There is the source of your pollution. From there Jesus set out for the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house there where he didn't think he would be found, but he couldn't escape notice. He was barely inside when a woman who had a disturbed daughter heard where he was. She came and knelt at his feet, begging for help. The woman was Greek, Syrophoenician by birth. She asked him to cure her daughter. He said, stand in line and take your turn. The children get fed first. If there's any left over, the dogs get it. She said, of course, master. But don't dogs under the table get scraps dropped by the children? Jesus was impressed. 
You're right. On your way. Your daughter is no longer disturbed. The demonic affliction is gone. She went home and found her daughter relaxed on the bed, the torment gone for good. Then he left the region of Tyre, went through Sidon back to Galilee Lake and over to the district of the Ten Towns. Some people brought a man who could neither hear nor speak and asked Jesus to lay a healing hand on him. He took the man off by himself, put his fingers in the man's ears and some spit on the man's tongue. Then Jesus looked up in prayer, groaned mightily, and commanded, Ephetha, open up. And it happened. The man's hearing was clear and his speech plain, just like that. Jesus urged them to keep it quiet, but they talked it up all the more, beside themselves with excitement. He's done it all and done it well. He gives hearing to the deaf, speech to the speechless. At about this same time he again found himself with a hungry crowd on his hands. He called his disciples together and said, This crowd is breaking my heart. They have stuck with me for three days, and now they have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they'll faint along the way, some of them have come a long distance. His disciples responded, What do you expect us to do about it? Buy food out here in the desert? He asked, How much bread do you have? Seven loaves, they said. So Jesus told the crowd to sit down on the ground. After giving thanks, he took the seven bread loaves, broke them into pieces, and gave them to his disciples so they could hand them out to the crowd. They also had a few fish. He pronounced a blessing over the fish and told his disciples to hand them out as well. The crowd ate its fill. Seven sacks of leftovers were collected. There were well over four thousand at the meal. Then he sent them home. He himself went straight to the boat with his disciples and set out for Dalmanutha. When they arrived, the Pharisees came out and started in on him, badgering him to prove himself, pushing him up against the wall. Provoked, he said, why does this generation clamor for miraculous guarantees? If I have anything to say about it, you'll not get so much as a hint of a guarantee. He then left them, got back in the boat, and headed for the other side. But the disciples forgot to pack a lunch. Except for a single loaf of bread, there wasn't a crumb in the boat. Jesus warned, be very careful. Keep a sharp eye out for the contaminating yeast of Pharisees and the followers of Herod. Meanwhile, the disciples were finding fault with each other because they had forgotten to bring bread. Jesus overheard and said, Why are you fussing because you forgot bread? Don't you see the point of all this? Don't you get it at all? Remember the five loaves I broke for the five thousand? How many baskets of leftovers did you pick up? They said, Twelve. And the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many bags full of leftovers did you get? Seven. He said, Do you still not get it? They arrived at Bethsaida. Some people brought a sightless man and begged Jesus to give him a healing touch. Taking him by the hand, he led him out of the village. He put spit in the man's eyes, laid hands on him, and asked, do you see anything? He looked up. I see men. They look like walking trees. So Jesus laid hands on his eyes again. The man looked hard and realized that he had recovered perfect sight, saw everything in bright, 2020 focus. Jesus sent him straight home, telling him, don't enter the village. Jesus and his disciples headed out for the villages around Caesarea Philippi. As they walked, he asked, Who do the people say I am? Some say John the Baptizer, 
they said. Others say Elijah. Still others say one of the prophets. He then asked, And you, what are you saying about me? Who am I? Peter gave the answer, You are the Christ, the Messiah. Jesus warned them to keep it quiet, not to breathe a word of it to anyone. He then began explaining things to them, It is necessary that the Son of Man proceed to an ordeal of suffering, be tried and found guilty by the elders, high priests, and religion scholars, be killed, and after three days rise up alive. He said this simply and clearly so they couldn't miss it. But Peter grabbed him in protest. Turning and seeing his disciples wavering, wondering what to believe, Jesus confronted Peter. Peter, get out of my way. Satan, get lost. You have no idea how God works. Calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat, I am. Don't run from suffering, embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to saving yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? What could you ever trade your soul for? If any of you are embarrassed over me and the way I'm leading you when you get around your fickle and unfocused friends, know that you'll be an even greater embarrassment to the Son of Man when he arrives in all the splendor of God, his Father, with an army of the holy angels. Then he drove it home by saying, This isn't pie in the sky by and by. Some of you who are standing here are going to see it happen, see the kingdom of God arrive in full force. Six days later, three of them did see it. Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain. His appearance changed from the inside out, right before their eyes. His clothes shimmered, glistening white, whiter than any bleach could make them. Elijah, along with Moses, came into view, in deep conversation with Jesus. Peter interrupted, Rabbi, this is a great moment. Let's build three memorials, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He blurted this out without thinking, stunned as they all were by what they were seeing. Just then a light radiant cloud enveloped them, and from deep in the cloud, a voice, this is my son, marked by my love. Listen to him. The next minute the disciples were looking around, rubbing their eyes, seeing nothing but Jesus, only Jesus. Coming down the mountain, Jesus swore them to secrecy. Don't tell a soul what you saw. After the Son of Man rises from the dead, you're free to talk. They puzzled over that, wondering what on earth, rising from the dead, meant. Meanwhile they were asking, why do the religion scholars say that Elijah has to come first? Jesus replied, Elijah does come first and get everything ready for the coming of the Son of Man. They treated this Elijah like dirt, much like they will treat the Son of Man, who will, according to scripture, suffer terribly and be kicked around contemptibly. When they came back down the mountain to the other disciples, they saw a huge crowd around them, and the religion scholars cross-examining them. As soon as the people in the crowd saw Jesus, admiring excitement stirred them. They ran and greeted him. He asked, What's going on? What's all the commotion? A man out of the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought my mute son, made speechless by a demon, to you. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and goes stiff as a board. I told your disciples, hoping they could deliver him, but they couldn't. Jesus said, What a generation! 
no sense of God. How many times do I have to go over these things? How much longer do I have to put up with this? Bring the boy here. They brought him. When the demon saw Jesus, it threw the boy into a seizure, causing him to writhe on the ground and foam at the mouth. He asked the boy's father, how long has this been going on? Ever since he was a little boy. Many times it pitches him into fire or the river to do away with him. If you can do anything, do it. Have a heart and help us. Jesus said, if. There are no ifs among believers. Anything can happen. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than the father cried, then I believe. Help me with my doubts. Seeing that the crowd was forming fast, Jesus gave the vile spirit its marching orders, dumb and deaf spirit, I command you, out of him, and stay out. Screaming, and with much thrashing about, it left. The boy was pale as a corpse, so people started saying, he's dead. But Jesus, taking his hand, raised him. The boy stood up. After arriving back home, his disciples cornered Jesus and asked, why couldn't we throw the demon out? He answered, there is no way to get rid of this kind of demon except by prayer. Leaving there, they went through Galilee. He didn't want anyone to know their whereabouts, for he wanted to teach his disciples. He told them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed to some people who want nothing to do with God. They will murder him. Three days after his murder, he will rise, alive. They didn't know what he was talking about, but were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was safe at home, he asked them, What were you discussing on the road? The silence was deafening. They had been arguing with one another over who among them was greatest. He sat down and summoned the twelve. So you want first place? Then take the last place. Be the servant of all. He put a child in the middle of the room. Then, cradling the little one in his arms, he said, Whoever embraces one of these children as I do embraces me, and far more than me, God who sent me. John spoke up, Teacher, we saw a man using your name to expel demons and we stopped him because he wasn't in our group. Jesus wasn't pleased. Don't stop him. No one can use my name to do something good and powerful, and in the next breath slam me. If he's not an enemy, he's an ally. Why? Anyone by just giving you a cup of water in my name is on our side. Count on it that God will notice. On the other hand, if you give one of these simple, childlike believers a hard time, bullying or taking advantage of their simple trust, you'll soon wish you hadn't. You'd be better off dropped in the middle of the lake with a millstone around your neck. If your hand or your foot gets in God's way, chop it off and throw it away. You're better off maimed or lame and alive than the proud owner of two hands and two feet, godless in a furnace of eternal fire. And if your eye distracts you from God, pull it out and throw it away. You're better off one-eyed and alive than exercising your 20-20 vision from inside the fire of hell. Everyone's going through a refining fire sooner or later, but you'll be well preserved, protected from the eternal flames. Be preservatives yourselves. Preserve the peace. From there he went to the area of Judea across the Jordan. A crowd of people, as was so often the case, went along, and he, as he so often did, taught them. Pharisees came up, intending to give him a hard time. They asked, Is it legal for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus said, What did Moses command? They answered, 
Moses gave permission to fill out a certificate of dismissal and divorce her. Jesus said, Moses wrote this command only as a concession to your hard-hearted ways. In the original creation, God made male and female to be together. Because of this, a man leaves father and mother, and in marriage he becomes one flesh with a woman, no longer two individuals, but forming a new unity. Because God created this organic union of the two sexes, no one should desecrate his art by cutting them apart. When they were back home, the disciples brought it up again. Jesus gave it to them straight, a man who divorces his wife so he can marry someone else commits adultery against her. And a woman who divorces her husband so she can marry someone else commits adultery. The people brought children to Jesus, hoping he might touch them. The disciples shooed them off. But Jesus was irate and let them know it, don't push these children away. Don't ever get between them and me. These children are at the very center of life in the kingdom. Mark this, unless you accept God's kingdom in the simplicity of a child, you'll never get in. Then, gathering the children up in his arms, he laid his hands of blessing on them. As he went out into the street, a man came running up, greeted him with great reverence, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? Jesus said, Why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. You know the commandments, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat, honor your father and mother. He said, Teacher, I have, from my youth, kept them all. Jesus looked him hard in the eye, and loved him. He said, There's one thing left, go sell whatever you own and give it to the poor. All your wealth will then be heavenly wealth. And come follow me. The man's face clouded over. This was the last thing he expected to hear, and he walked off with a heavy heart. He was holding on tight to a lot of things, and not about to let go. Looking at his disciples, Jesus said, Do you have any idea how difficult it is for people who have it all to enter God's kingdom? The disciples couldn't believe what they were hearing, but Jesus kept on, You can't imagine how difficult. I'd say it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for the rich to get into God's kingdom. That got their attention. Then who has any chance at all, they asked. Jesus was blunt, no chance at all if you think you can pull it off by yourself. Every chance in the world if you let God do it. Peter tried another angle, we left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Mark my words, no one who sacrifices house, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, land, whatever, because of me in the message will lose out. They'll get it all back, but multiplied many times in homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and land, but also in troubles. And then the bonus of eternal life. This is once again the great reversal, many who are first will end up last, and the last first. Back on the road, they set out for Jerusalem. Jesus had a head start on them, and they were following, puzzled and not just a little afraid. He took the twelve and began again to go over what to expect next. Listen to me carefully. We're on our way up to Jerusalem. When we get there, the Son of Man will be betrayed to the religious leaders and scholars. They will sentence him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Romans, who will mock and spit on him, give him the third degree, and kill him. After three days he will rise alive. James and John, Zebedee's sons, came up to him. Teacher, we have something we want you to do for us. What is it? I'll see what I can do. 
Arrange it, they said, so that we will be awarded the highest places of honor in your glory, one of us at your right, the other at your left. Jesus said, You have no idea what you're asking. Are you capable of drinking the cup I drink, of being baptized in the baptism I am about to be plunged into? Sure, they said. Why not? Jesus said, Come to think of it, you will drink the cup I drink, and be baptized in my baptism. But as to awarding places of honor, that's not my business. There are other arrangements for that. When the other ten heard of this conversation, they lost their tempers with James and John. Jesus got them together to settle things down. You've observed how godless rulers throw their weight around, he said, and when people get a little power how quickly it goes to their heads. It's not going to be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That is what the Son of Man has done, he came to serve, not to be served, and then to give away his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. They spent some time in Jericho. As Jesus was leaving town, trailed by his disciples in a parade of people, a blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting alongside the road. When he heard that Jesus the Nazarene was passing by, he began to cry out, Son of David, Jesus! Mercy, have mercy on me! Many tried to hush him up, but he yelled all the louder, Son of David! Mercy, have mercy on me! Jesus stopped in his tracks, called him over. They called him. It's your lucky day. Get up. He's calling you to come. Throwing off his coat, he was on his feet at once and came to Jesus. Jesus said, What can I do for you? The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. On your way, said Jesus. Your faith has saved and healed you. In that very instant he recovered his sight and followed Jesus down the road. When they were nearing Jerusalem, at Bethphage and Bethany on Mount Olives, he sent off two of the disciples with instructions, Go to the village across from you. As soon as you enter, you'll find a colt tethered, one that has never yet been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks, What are you doing? Say, the master needs him, and will return him right away. They went and found a colt tied to a door at the street corner and untied it. Some of those standing there said, What are you doing untying that colt? The disciples replied exactly as Jesus had instructed them, and the people let them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus, spread their coats on it, and he mounted. The people gave him a wonderful welcome, some throwing their coats on the street, others spreading out rushes they had cut in the fields. Running ahead and following after, they were calling out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in God's name! Blessed the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna in highest heaven! He entered Jerusalem, then entered the temple. He looked around, taking it all in. But by now it was late, so he went back to Bethany with the twelve. As they left Bethany the next day, he was hungry. Off in the distance he saw a fig tree in full leaf. He came up to it expecting to find something for breakfast, but found nothing but fig leaves. It wasn't yet the season for figs. He addressed the tree, No one is going to eat fruit from you again, ever. And his disciples overheard him. They arrived at Jerusalem. Immediately on entering the temple Jesus started throwing out everyone who had set up shop there, buying and selling. He kicked over the tables of the bankers and the stalls of the pigeon merchants. 
He didn't let anyone even carry a basket through the temple. And then he taught them, quoting this text. My house was designated a house of prayer for the nations. You've turned it into a hangout for thieves. The high priests and religion scholars heard what was going on and plotted how they might get rid of him. They panicked, for the entire crowd was carried away by his teaching. At evening, Jesus and his disciples left the city. In the morning, walking along the road, they saw the fig tree, shriveled to a dry stick. Peter, remembering what had happened the previous day, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is shriveled up. Jesus was matter of fact, embrace this God life. Really embrace it, and nothing will be too much for you. This mountain, for instance, just say, go jump in the lake, no shuffling or hemming and hawing, and it's as good as done. That's why I urge you to pray for absolutely everything, ranging from small to large. Include everything as you embrace this God life, and you'll get God's everything. And when you assume the posture of prayer, remember that it's not all asking. If you have anything against someone, forgive, only then will your Heavenly Father be inclined to also wipe your slate clean of sins. Then when they were back in Jerusalem once again, as they were walking through the temple, the high priests, religion scholars, and leaders came up and demanded, Show us your credentials. Who authorized you to speak and act like this? Jesus responded, First let me ask you a question. Answer my question and then I'll present my credentials. About the baptism of John, who authorized it, heaven or humans? Tell me. They were on the spot, and knew it. They pulled back into a huddle and whispered, If we say, heaven, he'll ask us why we didn't believe John. If we say, humans, we'll be up against it with the people because they all hold John up as a prophet. They decided to concede that round to Jesus. We don't know, they said. Jesus replied, then I won't answer your question either. Then Jesus started telling them stories. A man planted a vineyard. He fenced it, dug a winepress, erected a watchtower, turned it over to the farmhands, and went off on a trip. At the time for harvest, he sent a servant back to the farmhands to collect his profits. They grabbed him, beat him up, and sent him off empty-handed. So he sent another servant. That one they tarred and feathered. He sent another and that one they killed. And on and on, many others. Some they beat up, some they killed. Finally there was only one left, a beloved son. In a last-ditch effort, he sent him, thinking, surely they will respect my son. But those farmhands saw their chance. They rubbed their hands together in greed and said, This is the heir. Let's kill him and have it all for ourselves. They grabbed him, killed him, and threw him over the fence. What do you think the owner of the vineyard will do? Right. He'll come and get rid of everyone. Then he'll assign the care of the vineyard to others. Read it for yourselves in scripture. That stone the masons threw out. Is now the cornerstone. This is God's work. We rub our eyes, we can hardly believe it. They wanted to lynch him then and there but, intimidated by public opinion, held back. They knew the story was about them. They got away from there as fast as they could. They sent some Pharisees and followers of Herod to bait him, hoping to catch him saying something incriminating. They came up and said, Teacher, we know you have integrity, that you are indifferent to public opinion, don't pander to your students and teach the way of God accurately. Tell us, 
Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He knew it was a trick question, and said, Why are you playing these games with me? Bring me a coin and let me look at it. They handed him one. This engraving, who does it look like? And whose name is on it? Caesar, they said. Jesus said, Give Caesar what is his, and give God what is his. Their mouths hung open, speechless. Some Sadducees, the party that denies any possibility of resurrection, came up and asked, Teacher, Moses wrote that if a man dies and leaves a wife but no child, his brother is obligated to marry the widow and have children. Well, there once were seven brothers. The first took a wife. He died childless. The second married her. He died, and still no child. The same with the third. All seven took their turn, but no child. Finally the wife died. When they are raised at the resurrection, whose wife is she? All seven were her husband. Jesus said, You're way off base, and here's why. 1. You don't know what God said. 2. You don't know how God works. After the dead are raised up, we're past the marriage business. As it is with angels now, all our ecstasies and intimacies then will be with God. And regarding the dead, whether or not they are raised, don't you ever read the Bible? How God at the bush said to Moses, I am, not was, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The living God is God of the living, not the dead. Your way, way off base. One of the religion scholars came up. Hearing the lively exchanges of question and answer and seeing how sharp Jesus was in his answers, he put in his question, which is most important of all the commandments. Jesus said, the first in importance is, listen, Israel, the Lord your God is one, so love the Lord God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence and energy. And here is the second, love others as well as you love yourself. There is no other commandment that ranks with these. The religion scholar said, a wonderful answer, teacher. So clear-cut and accurate, that God is one and there is no other. And loving him with all passion and intelligence and energy, and loving others as well as you love yourself. Why, that's better than all offerings and sacrifices put together. When Jesus realized how insightful he was, he said, You're almost there, right on the border of God's kingdom. After that, no one else dared ask a question. While he was teaching in the temple, Jesus asked, How is it that the religion scholars say that the Messiah is David's son, when we all know that David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said, God said to my master, Sit here at my right hand, until I put your enemies under your feet. David here designates the Messiah, my master, so how can the Messiah also be his son? The large crowd was delighted with what they heard. He continued teaching. Watch out for the religion scholars. They love to walk around in academic gowns, preening in the radiance of public flattery, basking in prominent positions, sitting at the head table at every church function. And all the time they are exploiting the weak and helpless. The longer their prayers, the worse they get. But they'll pay for it in the end. Sitting across from the offering box, he was observing how the crowd tossed money in for the collection. Many of the rich were making large contributions. One poor widow came up and put in two small coins, a measly two cents. Jesus called his disciples over and said, The truth is that this poor widow gave more to the collection than all the others put together. 
All the others gave what they'll never miss, she gave extravagantly what she couldn't afford, she gave her all. As he walked away from the temple, one of his disciples said, Teacher, look at that stonework. Those buildings. Jesus said, You're impressed by this grandiose architecture. There's not a stone in the whole works that is not going to end up in a heap of rubble. Later, as he was sitting on Mount Olives in full view of the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew got him off by himself and asked, Tell us, when is this going to happen? What sign will we get that things are coming to a head? Jesus began, Watch out for doomsday deceivers. Many leaders are going to show up with forged identities claiming, I'm the one. They will deceive a lot of people. When you hear of wars and rumored wars, keep your head and don't panic. This is routine history, and no sign of the end. Nation will fight nation and ruler fight ruler, over and over. Earthquakes will occur in various places. There will be famines. But these things are nothing compared to what's coming. And watch out. They're going to drag you into court. And then it will go from bad to worse, dog eat dog, everyone at your throat because you carry my name. You're placed there as sentinels to truth. The message has to be preached all across the world. When they bring you, betrayed, into court, don't worry about what you'll say. When the time comes, say what's on your heart, the Holy Spirit will make his witness in and through you. It's going to be brother killing brother, father killing child, children killing parents. There's no telling who will hate you because of me. Stay with it, that's what is required. Stay with it to the end. You won't be sorry, you'll be saved. But be ready to run for it when you see the monster of desecration set up where it should never be. You who can read, make sure you understand what I'm talking about. If you're living in Judea at the time, run for the hills, if you're working in the yard, don't go back to the house to get anything, if you're out in the field, don't go back to get your coat. Pregnant and nursing mothers will have it especially hard. Hope and pray this won't happen in the middle of winter. These are going to be hard days, nothing like it from the time God made the world right up to the present. And there will be nothing like it again. If he let the days of trouble run their course, nobody would make it. But because of God's chosen people, those he personally chose, he has already intervened. If anyone tries to flag you down, calling out, here's the Messiah, or points, there he is, don't fall for it. Fake messiahs and lying preachers are going to pop up everywhere. Their impressive credentials and bewitching performances will pull the wool over the eyes of even those who ought to know better. So watch out. I've given you fair warning. Following those hard times. Sun will fade out. Moon cloud over. Stars fall out of the sky. Cosmic powers tremble. And then they'll see the Son of Man enter in grand style, his arrival filling the sky, no one will miss it. He'll dispatch the angels, they will pull in the chosen from the four winds, from pole to pole. Take a lesson from the fig tree. From the moment you notice its buds form, the merest hint of green, you know summer's just around the corner. And so it is with you. When you see all these things, you know he is at the door. Don't take this lightly. I'm not just saying this for some future generation, but for this one, too, these things will happen. Sky and earth will wear out, my words won't wear out. But the exact day and hour? No one knows that, not even heaven's angels, not even the Son. Only the Father. So keep a sharp lookout, 
for you don't know the timetable. It's like a man who takes a trip, leaving home and putting his servants in charge, each assigned a task, and commanding the gatekeeper to stand watch. So, stay at your post, watching. You have no idea when the homeowner is returning, whether evening, midnight, cockcrow, or morning. You don't want him showing up unannounced, with you asleep on the job. I say it to you, and I'm saying it to all, stay at your post. Keep watch. In only two days the eight-day festival of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread would begin. The high priests and religion scholars were looking for a way they could seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. They agreed that it should not be done during Passover week. We don't want the crowds up in arms, they said. Jesus was at Bethany, a guest of Simon the leper. While he was eating dinner, a woman came up carrying a bottle of very expensive perfume. Opening the bottle, she poured it on his head. Some of the guests became furious among themselves. That's criminal. A sheer waste. This perfume could have been sold for well over a year's wages and handed out to the poor. They swelled up in anger, nearly bursting with indignation over her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why are you giving her a hard time? She has just done something wonderfully significant for me. You will have the poor with you every day for the rest of your lives. Whenever you feel like it, you can do something for them. Not so with me. She did what she could when she could, she pre-anointed my body for burial. And you can be sure that wherever in the whole world the message is preached, what she just did is going to be talked about admiringly. Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the cabal of high priests, determined to betray him. They couldn't believe their ears, and promised to pay him well. He started looking for just the right moment to hand him over. On the first of the days of unleavened bread, the day they prepare the Passover sacrifice, his disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations so you can eat the Passover meal? He directed two of his disciples, go into the city. A man carrying a water jug will meet you. Follow him. Ask the owner of whichever house he enters, the teacher wants to know, where is my guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will show you a spacious second-story room, swept and ready. Prepare for us there. The disciples left, came to the city, found everything just as he had told them, and prepared the Passover meal. After sunset he came with the twelve. As they were at the supper table eating, Jesus said, I have something hard but important to say to you, one of you is going to hand me over to the conspirators, one who at this moment is eating with me. Stunned, they started asking, one after another, It isn't me, is it? He said, It's one of the twelve, one who eats with me out of the same bowl. In one sense, it turns out that the Son of Man is entering into a way of treachery well marked by the Scriptures, no surprises here. In another sense, the man who turns him in, turns traitor to the Son of Man, better never to have been born than do this. In the course of their meal, having taken and blessed the bread, he broke it and gave it to them. Then he said, Take, this is my body. Taking the chalice, he gave it to them, thanking God, and they all drank from it. He said, This is my blood. God's new covenant poured out for many people. I'll not be drinking wine again until the new day when I drink it in the kingdom of God. They sang a hymn and then went directly to Mount Olives. Jesus told them, you're all going to feel that your world is falling apart and that it's my fault. There's a scripture that says, 
I will strike the shepherd. The sheep will scatter. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you, leading the way to Galilee. Peter blurted out, Even if everyone else is ashamed of you when things fall to pieces, I won't be. Jesus said, Don't be so sure. Today, this very night in fact, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. He blustered in protest, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. All the others said the same thing. At dawn's first light, the high priests, with the religious leaders and scholars, arranged a conference with the entire Jewish council. After tying Jesus securely, they took him out and presented him to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered, If you say so. The high priests let loose a barrage of accusations. Pilate asked again, Aren't you going to answer anything? That's quite a list of accusations. Still, he said nothing. Pilate was impressed, really impressed. It was a custom at the feast to release a prisoner, anyone the people asked for. There was one prisoner called Barabbas, locked up with the insurrectionists who had committed murder during the uprising against Rome. As the crowd came up and began to present its petition for him to release a prisoner, Pilate anticipated them, Do you want me to release the king of the Jews to you? Pilate knew by this time that it was through sheer spite that the high priests had turned Jesus over to him. But the high priests by then had worked up the crowd to ask for the release of Barabbas. Pilate came back, So what do I do with this man you call king of the Jews? They yelled, Nail him to a cross. Pilate objected, But for what crime? But they yelled all the louder, Nail him to a cross. Pilate gave the crowd what it wanted, set Barabbas free and turned Jesus over for whipping and crucifixion. The soldiers took Jesus into the palace, called Praetorium, and called together the entire brigade. They dressed him up in purple and put a crown plaited from a thorn bush on his head. Then they began their mockery, Bravo, King of the Jews. They banged on his head with a club, spit on him, and knelt down in mock worship. After they had had their fun, they took off the purple cape and put his own clothes back on him. Then they marched out to nail him to the cross. There was a man walking by, coming from work, Simon from Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. They made him carry Jesus' cross. The soldiers brought Jesus to Golgotha, meaning, Skull Hill. They offered him a mild painkiller, wine mixed with myrrh, but he wouldn't take it. And they nailed him to the cross. They divided up his clothes and threw dice to see who would get them. They nailed him up at nine o'clock in the morning. The charge against him, the king of the Jews, was scrawled across a sign. Along with him, they crucified two criminals, one to his right, the other to his left. People passing along the road jeered, shaking their heads in mock lament, you bragged that you could tear down the temple and then rebuild it in three days, so show us your stuff. Save yourself. If you're really God's son, come down from that cross. The high priests, along with the religion scholars, were right there mixing it up with the rest of them, having a great time poking fun at him, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Messiah, is he? King of Israel? Then let him climb down from that cross. We'll all become believers then. Even the men crucified alongside him joined in the mockery. At noon the sky became extremely dark. The darkness lasted three hours. At three o'clock, Jesus groaned out of the depths, crying loudly, Aloy, Aloy, Lama Sabachthani, which means, 
My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders who heard him said, Listen, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran off, soaked a sponge in sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. But Jesus, with a loud cry, gave his last breath. At that moment the temple curtain ripped right down the middle. When the Roman captain standing guard in front of him saw that he had quit breathing, he said, This has to be the Son of God. There were women watching from a distance, among them Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of the younger James and Hoses, and Salome. When Jesus was in Galilee, these women followed and served him, and had come up with him to Jerusalem. Late in the afternoon, since it was the day of preparation, that is, Sabbath Eve, Joseph of Arimathea, a highly respected member of the Jewish council, came. He was one who lived expectantly, on the lookout for the kingdom of God. Working up his courage, he went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate questioned whether he could be dead that soon and called for the captain to verify that he was really dead. Assured by the captain, he gave Joseph the corpse. Having already purchased a linen shroud, Joseph took him down, wrapped him in the shroud, placed him in a tomb that had been cut into the rock and rolled a large stone across the opening. Mary Magdalene and Mary, mother of Jose's, watched the burial. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they could embalm him. Very early on Sunday morning, as the sun rose, they went to the tomb. They worried out loud to each other, who will roll back the stone from the tomb for us. Then they looked up, saw that it had been rolled back, it was a huge stone, and walked right in. They saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed all in white. They were completely taken aback, astonished. He said, Don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus the Nazarene, the one they nailed on the cross. He's been raised up, he's here no longer. You can see for yourselves that the place is empty. Now, on your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going on ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there, exactly as he said. They got out as fast as they could, beside themselves, their heads swimming. Stunned, they said nothing to anyone. After rising from the dead, Jesus appeared early on Sunday morning to Mary Magdalene, whom he had delivered from seven demons. She went to his former companions, now weeping and carrying on, and told them. When they heard her report that she had seen him alive and well, they didn't believe her. Later he appeared, but in a different form, to two of them out walking in the countryside. They went back and told the rest, but they weren't believed either. Still later, as the eleven were eating supper, he appeared and took them to task most severely for their stubborn unbelief, refusing to believe those who had seen him raised up. Then he said, Go into the world. Go everywhere and announce the message of God's good news to one and all. Whoever believes and is baptized is saved, whoever refuses to believe is damned. These are some of the signs that will accompany believers, they will throw out demons in my name, they will speak in new tongues, they will take snakes in their hands, they will drink poison and not be hurt, they will lay hands on the sick and make them well. Then the Master Jesus, after briefing them, was taken up to heaven, and he sat down beside God in the place of honor. And the disciples went everywhere preaching, the Master working right with them, validating the message with indisputable evidence. Note, Mark 16 verses 9 to 20, the portion in brackets, is not found in the earliest handwritten copies.